We'll go back to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. 3D printing houses in one day. We've got that story plus boycotting Coke. But first, Vault 7, as we all now know, was the WikiLeaks release of the so-called largest ever publication of CIA hacking tools. Now, as everybody's diving into all of this stuff, there's going to be... Probably some pretty amazing revelations. There's also going to be lots of wild geese chases and red herrings and other funny animal sayings that mean distraction. But there's also lots of confirmation to stories we've discussed over the previous 300 episodes of New World Next Week, like this one. CIA can hack cars to carry out undetectable assassinations, just like Michael Hastings. And we grab an article from our friend Claire Burnish, who notes award-winning journalist Michael Hastings garnered international acclaim for coverage of the Iraq War and had established a comfortable career with BuzzFeed, GQ, and Rolling Stone when his life abruptly ended in a fiery one-car crash under suspicious circumstances. A prominent national security official claimed it was consistent with a cyber car attack. That was Richard A. Clark talking to the Huffington Post. Now with... WikiLeaks release of this voluminous cache of CIA documents known as Vault 7. It seems like Clark is right yet again. So Hastings, of course, as we've noted here on these shows and James more extensively in your work, Hastings rose to prominence with the reporting of the Iraq War for Newsweek, but it was his big old expose for Rolling Stone in 2010, The Runaway General, where he wrote about General Stanley McChrystal, commander of NATO's International Assistance Security Force, in the Afghanistan war that even earned Hastings the George Polk Award ultimately cost General McChrystal his career and perhaps cost Hastings his life. Hastings' last article, I think it's important to note for BuzzFeed, was the, titled Why Democrats Love to Spy on Americans. Now, there's a movie coming out on Netflix with Brad Pitt as the Stanley McChrystal character, because I know that's exactly the first person you would think of to cast as a Stanley McChrystal character. So obviously, taking a little bit of Hollywood liberties. It's called War Machine, and it's coming out on Netflix on May 26th. And hopefully, as we get to that release date, we'll have some more interesting information related to that. But it's actually based on the nonfiction book, The Operators, by Michael Hastings. James, I know you've talked about this a lot, and there are probably lots of other areas that we could and will talk about with regards to Vault 7. So, again, Michael Hastings. Yes, and uh, so just to follow up on all of that, of course, people should check out my Crashes of Convenience episode on Michael Hastings if they haven't done so, which laid it all out years ago, talking exactly about this and about how, hey, you know, they really can hack into cars and they can do things like this. And that was doubly and triply confirmed by people like Richard Clark, you know, former National Security Advisor, coming out and saying that in the wake of the Hastings crash, which was pretty remar remarkable at the time. But there you go. So this is as you say, just confirmation of what we know. And just as a little tag on to that uh, operator's uh, story that you got there with the uh, Brad Pitt Hollywoodization, uh, big hat tip to Scott Horton on Twitter who um, uh, provided screenshots of the part in the operators where McChrystal's SAS guy threatens to kill Michael Hastings. So <laughs> that little tidbit's in the book as well, um, just for people who haven't seen it. And I'll put the link in the show notes so that you can see read through that passage in the operators. But um, but I think the bigger point here is obviously Vault 7 in general and what this is uh, about. And I think confirmation might be one way of looking at this because it's not just Hastings. It's, oh, by the way, your smart TV is watching you and a lot of other things that have been talked about in the independent media that, again, made us conspiracy theory kooks. I think we are moving into the era of... We are all conspiracy theorists now. I, I think that slur really is going, has lost its power, is losing its power. Uh, who on earth with a straight face can say, oh, that's crazy conspiracy talk when you talk about these types of machinations of the intelligence agencies at this point? They're openly talking about the deep state on the nightly news now. They're openly uh, talking about the CIA and they can hack into everything and watching you through your television. I mean, it is total inversion of everything that people believed to be true five or ten years ago. And of course, a lot of people are just going to go through the uh, cognitive dissonance thing where they go, well, of course, of course, that's what they're doing. It's no, it's no big deal. And some people are just going to accept it. But I think here's the, here's the big takeaway from all of this. Um, I, we've see, This is the problem. And we are moving into the reaction stage. And that stage is going to shape the solution stage. I don't think it's set in stone yet. 
I think there are a lot of different ways that this can fall out. But obviously, the people who manage these types of events and the public reaction to them are going to manage them in the way that is most profitable and beneficial to them. I don't just mean profitable in the monetary sense. So, um, so uh, the real question is, how are people going to react to this and what is going to be the solution? And very interesting to see to, uh, WikiLeaks on Twitter drawing attention to an idea that came up a few weeks ago from Microsoft, our good, reliable friends at Microsoft, who are now proposing a Geneva Convention to, uh, to try to sort out cyber attacks and cyber warfare so that it doesn't harm civilians. Well, that sounds great. And they're talking about how, well, the Geneva Convention, the Geneva Accords, requires a Red Cross type of organization to be the neutral arbiter of that, that type of uh, uh, plan. So now we have to ask the tech companies to be the neutral arbiter of the new Geneva Convention for Cyber warfare. I mean, uh, we can see the way this reaction could be shaped in so many different ways. Uh, fingerprint scanning license plate to get on the internet? Yeah, I mean, the internet, the intelligence agencies need to have this kind of information because there are terrorists, bad boogeymen out there that are doing things. So, you know, but the way they're doing it right now is under the table and shady. Maybe maybe if we just all scanned our fingernet, the fingerprints to get on the internet, and then, then everything will be solved. We'll just give it to them directly, and they don't have to do these kind of hardware, you know, shenanigans. And, and things. I mean, there's so many different ways this could be used for the bad. In the meantime, I think we're going to have to highlight stories like this and how it relates to things like Michael Hastings. Uh, highlight, oh, by the way, yeah, the CIA can make it look like the Russians are hacking this or that system. You know, oh, wow, who would have thought it? Except us. We've been talking about virtual flag terror for years now. Now it's there in the WikiLeaks dump. So there's good to come out of this, but it's very, very dangerous which way they end up taking this. James, you, I think you accidentally coined a new word, fingernet. So we'll, <laughs> that, that'll show up, and that's that's what they'll call it. <laughs> um, the other one of the other frightening parts of that is that now the stage is set again for what you know. Could, we've always kind of called an I nine eleven event as everybody sort of thinking about it. You know, those are those moments when when just you say that's that's when the the, the problem and the reaction and the solution yeah. all kind of roll and around. Trump talks about wiretapping and now suddenly we're looking at this. So yes, these events do tend to line up like that. I've got a sidebar question for you, James. Um, have you downloaded the files? I have not. Have you looked at any of them? Only some of the t tweets. So actually, no way. I haven't looked at files. Have I heard people say they haven't found any files? To there download? are. There are. I've looked at a few of them. I haven't downloaded them all. It's gobbledygook nonsense to me. And I imagine to 99.9% .9 of the people out there, I invite people to actually go and look at these, but it is gobbledygook tech nonsense that, you know, I, I, we're just going to be relying on what tech people are saying about this to a large extent. So keep that in mind when you're uh, reading about this. Everything you're reading about these documents is people's interpretation of these documents. So keep that in mind when you're looking at something like this. So as long as, I mean, we're still kind of talking about Vault 7, let me then ask you one more question. So the idea, we kind of see this, that the CIA built all these cyber weapons and then lost control of it. Do you think in some ways it's do they really are they surprised that they lost control of these things or were they again the the classic you know the create the weapons then you let them go a fast and fast and furious kind of way yeah uh it's very difficult to believe that I mean, even if this wasn't intentionally seeded out there to be leaked by a WikiLeaks, which it certainly could be, and that wouldn't surprise me in the least, but even if that wasn't the intention, the idea that this never occurred to them, that this might get out, and they might have to have some operational security around this, I don't know, it stinks to high heaven. But again, either way, I mean, whether it was some intentional, let's put this out there to let the plebs know we're spying on them, or whether it just got out there, I still think the real... The real action here is the reaction solution. We're at, the, at that stage now. So there's different ways this could go, and very few of them, I think, redound in our favor. Most of them will ultimately be, we need more power to the governments to look over and, you know, come up with some solution to this problem. And uh, it's scary. So let's flip the script here on episode 301 of New World next week as we move to the question of why more than a million traders, why are they? Boycotting Coca-Cola and Pepsi in India. This article written by Kerry Wedler. Two organizations in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu are boycotting Coca-Cola and Pepsi amid concerns the two companies are using excessive amounts of water to produce their drinks. The Guardian reports that more than a million traders, these are stock traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S, are now boycotting the drinks. According to Business Standard, 
Retailers and shopkeepers in the state have begun to boycott Pepsi and Coca-Cola, though many restaurants and supermarkets continuing to sell and they've sought some extra time. Some retailers have, of course, also vowed to ignore the boycott and continue selling the sugary stuff. Coke and Pepsi are, of course, not the only companies getting pushback for their water usage. And again, this is just a, a, a quick blip of a much larger article. And this, I always have to say, everything we say is always down in the show notes. You can get the full articles and you can continue the research on your own. Nestle, like we've talked about on this show many times, they've, of course, been under fire, not only in Oregon right here, but in other places all around, drought-stricken California, as well as some unsavory ingredients in some of its products in India. So, James, you actually shared this one on your Twitter account using hashtag New World Next Week. Is this another, I mean, positive, it was just a few weeks ago we saw the, the gates getting kicked out of India? Yeah, I mean, it certainly seems to be in line with, uh, a, I don't know if a growing consciousness or at least the uh, growing willingness to flex some muscles, um, as it were, um, in the Indian public. And hopefully this is a sign of things to come. Uh, not just in India, but around the world. And it's interesting, uh, just on the latest questions for Corbett, we were talking about, has anyone thought of, you know, boycotting and shorting some of these companies to, to make them go under? And I, I was like, oh yeah, Karma Bank. Remember that idea from years and years and years ago? The idea was, let's start a boycott campaign of Coca-Cola and short the stock. And hey, you can make money while the, the corporation tanks. Hey, win-win. Uh, still think that's a, that, that concept is a good idea, even if you don't have to play the, you know, shorting stock or whatever, but the boycotts obviously is our main power as consumers in a consumer materialist society. Our main power is to say, no, I'm not going to drink your crap. And that's the type of thing where it's great if you have a mass boycott movement and it you know brings down a corporation. But even if it doesn't, even if that is not taking place, even if you don't know anyone in your life who wants to boycott Coca-Cola or any of these other horrible corporations that we know are destroying the planet, you can still do it yourself. And it look, I know we're not sitting up here on high horse clouds floating above everyone. Uh, we, we all interact with these multi-global organizations and co companies and everything every day. But it is the point about just, just changing your habits just a little bit, just a little bit at a time. Instead of going out and buying a, a Coke or whatever so while you're driving or something, bring a water bottle or bring something from home. And just change your habits a little bit at a time, and you can affect the change in yourself. And that's, at the end of the day, that's the only thing you can do, is change yourself and be be the change that you want others to, to see and emulate. And so I'm all on board for big boycott movements, and I think this should be going on, and I'm applauding it where it happens. But it can also happen on the individual level to every person who's listening to the, my voice right now. I And I've talked about this a bunch as well. That it becomes a it becomes a buzz in and of itself. The more you start to kind of take action over what you've removed from your life and what things you aren't using and that you don't have to worry about it anymore, it starts to yeah you kind of get jazzed just on that. Um, the Karma Bank was in the boycott of Coke. Was that a Max Kaiser thing? I do remember that okay. was yeah. It was a, maybe almost a decade ago by now. We also had the story we covered here on some point back in, in the New World Next Week archives where we talked about Unilever and, and their, their misdeeds in India where there was a protest song. So we can include that flashback in the show notes as well, James. As we move, I think this is kind of two good news stories here. So two good news stories outweighing the one, I suppose, bad news story. Our third and final story this week on episode 301, 3D printed house takes less than a day to build and only costs 10,000 bucks. This via Matt Agarist, groundbreaking potential solution to homelessness and poverty, now reality thanks to a company called Apis Core. The company, based in, of course, Russia and San Francisco, has developed the capability to print, to 3D print, an entire house in 24 hours. As The Telegraph reports, Nikita Chin Yun Tai the inventor of the mobile printer and founder of Apis Core explained his desire to automate everything. I don't know if it sounds like there's tinted fingers there a little bit, but what sets Apis Core's product apart from the rest is its mobile printing technology can print everything right there kind of on site. And there's some pretty amazing video that shows how all of this works. And James, ultimately, to kind of jump down to the end, there is a lot of fine print here. There is more than some assembly required here, and there'll be lots of lots of painting, lots of windows, lots of fixtures, lots of fittings, 
a lot of that. But it's just, again, do we file this under the same kind of mind virus idea of the memes of not buying Coke in the first place and also learning these technologies exist? Let's move towards that. Yeah, I think this is we can file this under the uh, the phenomenon of these incredible great ideas that uh, are ideas at this point. And yeah, you, there is this specific real world application and everyone's going to look at this and go, well, that's a little 400 square foot, tiny little house. It's ridiculous. I wouldn't live in there. I, and look, you got to put the fit, you got to do the insulation and put the fittings and the roof on manually. Oh, it's just, but people miss the actual bigger idea here, which of course is the automated construction of a house, which is going to improve. The technology is going to improve over time. So what you're seeing right now is just the, the prototype, just the, 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 uh, the, 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 the first test of this technology, really. And it's like 3D printing in general. People look at the 3D printer making a little plastic goo do- do- and go, oh, well, what's the big deal? And then they look at a 3D printer building a house and they're like, oh, what's the big deal? <laughs> I mean, it is improving. It's technology that's improving and it's the idea behind it. And again, I think you're right. This is technology that could be incredible. It could be harnessed for the good of humanity. Or people can uh, kind of poo-poo it and dismiss it and let the big evil corporations take over this technology and uh, puppet uh, and steer which which way it's going to be implemented. Um, I don't think that's a good idea. So I think, uh, again, this is one of those really, really big ideas that people should be thinking about and not looking at the specific example here, which is a prototype kind of idea, but looking at where this is going in the future, because it won't be very long. It'll be, uh, you know, a decade from now. Can you imagine how much more advanced this is going to be, let alone two or three decades from now? So if we're maybe already running a little long here, let me ask you the, then be the devil's advocate question. What about for all, all the people who would say, this just ties in with that Agenda 30, man. They're going to cram us all into these tiny houses and we're all going to be eating crickets. Yeah, yeah. And again, I think that's the danger of looking at this particular prototype house and thinking this is what the ultimate game plan is. Well, no, I think this is just the first thing that this technology can do. And eventually it will, you know, you want to build a 3 billion square foot mansion? (laughs) I'm sure there will be a 3D printer for that at some point, Um, but maybe not one that's affordable for most people who can't afford a 3 billion square foot mansion. But again, I think it's just the the question of just scaling the technology and and, uh, getting it, you know, advancing the, the, the types of materials materials it's working with and what have you. But that's technological improvements that are coming. This particular instantiation of it is not the idea itself. That's, I think, the same way I try and think about, you know, when we still talk about whether, you know, the Napster explosion or whether it's Uber or Airbnb or these things. It doesn't have to be them. It's, again, it's it's the idea that's exciting. Let's close with even more good news. I finally did another episode of Good News Next Week, the spinoff from this new world next week. I call it Sharing is Fundamental. It's got a bunch of stories about solutions and collaborations, and it's up on my YouTube channel. And, of course, James, you and I can only do this with the support of everyone out there, and I've been trying to bring more attention to the Patreon account. It seems like a nice, simple, easy way for people to give the monthly support to keep going that we need. Well, thank you for a very lengthy update this week, <laughs> but a lot of very good material in here. I hope people check out the show notes, the lots and li- links uh, provided as always. Thank you, James, for putting it together. All right, man. Thank you.